I started uh, this uh, the first session with a statement why uh, this is uh, so important for the Czech that this agreement would be successfully completed. And I said that uh, A, we are a trading country, so we do have the interest on opening the trade and the related matters. But I have also said, and that's the B, uh, the transatlantic link, transatlantic bond is something vital for us, uh, approaching from other perspective. And the fact is that uh, the security relationship, uh, although it's embodied in ADA, uh, do have, does have some uh, problem or it's dealing with uh, this age of austerity, lack of finances, uh, to the defenses, etc. And therefore it's important to cement the relationship also in the other area like economy. And thus to give the new energy to the transatlantic bond as such. And I think that there is no better uh, 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 metaphor for this kind of a shift from defense to economy uh, then the name of the Czech uh, envoy uh, for the current uh, TTIP uh, talks, and that's Veronika uh, Kuchinova-Schmigolova, uh, uh, a woman which I, I used to, uh, to nickname something like Margaret Tetcherova, or Thatcher of the Czech diplomacy, <laughs> a woman which... Uh, I would say, although in a very young age, uh, I called a veteran of this uh, transatlantic uh, security effort. She was uh, very active uh, since the beginning of, as a young uh, woman, when we were approaching, uh, when we were pushing this uh, NATO enlargement agenda, she has spent a time as uh, the number two with our uh, embassy uh, to NATO. Uh, she was our ambassador at Vienna to OSCE and UN, um, uh, including, you know, the CFE package, that's mostly the security. Uh, she was uh, in the team uh, which was negotiating uh, uh, the issue of the uh, U.S. Uh, ballistic missile defense uh, uh, here uh, in Prague a few years ago, uh, serving together with Tomáš Poyar and... In fact, she was the negotiator, and she completed, you know, what was expected because the agreements were completed. Then they were not uh, ratified, and President Obama has changed uh, 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 the scheme. So now the new mission of uh, Veronica is uh, to give the Czech flavor to the TTIP uh, talks. Of course, some of uh, the issues are in the exclusive competence of uh, the European Commission, like trade, but there are some issues which uh, are still the responsibility of the member states, so therefore the national engagement is, uh, is uh, pretty important. So, Veronica, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you, Sasha, very much for all the compliments you have said about me. Uh, I just hope that uh, someone will not change the framework again and uh, the TTIP will not go the same way as our uh, ballistic missile defense agreement a few years ago. I must say, after the presentations of this afternoon, I am tempted uh, to say, ladies and gentlemen, everything uh, that could have been said about TTIP has been said already. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not say that because first, Sasha would be disappointed, and second, it would not be fair to all of you that came to, to listen to uh, for my, my presentation. Uh, for, also, as a government official, I am uh, in a difficult situation here because the negotiations are led by the European Commission and the EU should present a united blog here. And uh, we, you, you have heard the, the, the presentation of the, of the EU representative already. 
if I present a different view, uh, if, uh, I would uh, we be weakening the EU position if I uh, if, uh, pr just uh, support uh, if, uh, the, everything that has be been said by the EU. I could uh, be accused of not defending enough the, the, the Czech interests. Uh, I will uh, solve this dilemma by saying I am speaking on my own behalf and the views presented are my, my personal views. Uh, Moreover, I have put some figures in uh, my presentation and I hope they at least a little bit correspond to the figures uh, presented uh, by the, the previous speakers. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'll try to present some potential arguments, uh, mostly political arguments, in favor of the TTIP because I am uh, I'm strongly in favor of TTIP and uh, strong transatlantic relations. Uh, and also, I'll try to shed some light on the, 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 the few Czech interests we have in, in, this, in this area. Uh, I believe that uh, TTIP, if successfully concluded, is uh, potentially one of the most significant events of the 21st century. It could affect trade, manufacturing, safety, regulatory standards. It could alter power dynamics across the globe. Uh, given its possible impact, it's in fact receiving surprisingly little attention uh, for both in the EU and in the US. Uh, and I'm glad uh, we have the opportunity here uh, to, to shed more light on the, the role this uh, potential treaty might play. Uh, from the previous speaker spoke already about uh, the economic crisis on both sides of Atlantic's, uh, Atlantic that emphasized uh, the, the, the importance of uh, strong transatlantic economic bond uh, and uh, also I must say showed uh, the, the interconnection between EU and US uh, not only in the security area as we were used to but also in the economic area. Uh, in the uh, for last years, uh, for, for, from the beginning of the century, I would say the center of gravity of world economy has been shifting towards Asia and Latin America. Emerging economies uh, started to play more active role in glo global trade as well as in global politics. Uh, it is not necessary to stress this, that this trend might in the long run weaken the economics of both the U.S. and the member states of the EU. Uh, the best alternative for the Euro-Atlantic area is to become more efficient uh, and more competitive. Uh, for, again, the figures shown by some of the previous speakers uh, already, already pointed to the fact that uh, EU and US produced together almost half of the world GDP. I think it was 44% uh, on, the, on the slide shown here. My, my figure here says 46%, but that's not such a big difference. Mm, uh, for, uh, recognizing this, uh, for, uh, for, that there were, and it was already mentioned again uh, by, by the previous speaker, for, for many years, uh, the, the attempts to, to, to more closely coordinate uh, EU and US in the area uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of the trade. Uh, successful conclusion of such an agreement, uh, of, of, I think, would not only benefit the EU and US, but also strengthen the world economy in, in, in general. Uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, the, there are uh, differences uh, between uh, uh, of EU member states when discussing the, the, the impact of the TTIP, but uh, uh, there is a general agreement that uh, uh, TTIP is too advantageous to all parties to, 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 to reject uh, this, this possibility. It's not only about uh, lowering trade barriers, uh, it is also about setting rules. Uh, this uh, strong EU-US bloc uh, with common and mutually recognized standards 
would have a big chance to form a reference framework, uh, and it was also mentioned before, sorry, for technological and other standards around the world. Uh, I must also say as a strong uh, f f supporter of a transatlantic bond uh, that uh, f the shared values of both sides of Atlantic, such as a rule of law, human rights, uh, f uh, will uh, f form a base of this regulatory common framework and uh, in this sense uh, will s help to strengthen the role of these values in the world. Uh, f of course, TTIP would bo boost experts in almost all sectors. Uh, it would be uh, especially beneficial to certain sectors in both U EU and US, such as motor vehicles, uh, metal products, processed foods. Uh, uh, well, I have some more numbers. Uh, according to some, some statistics, uh, an ambitious and comprehensive TTIP could generate uh, yearly economic gains for the EU of 119 billion euros, uh, uh, for which, uh, as uh, was uh, pointed out in one study, is almost 500 euros per, per family in the EU. Uh, for, and similar data for the US uh, talk about 122 billion US dollars uh, per year. I don't know what uh, if. if uh, uh, the, the, the American friends uh, agree with that, uh, with, with that uh, f uh, framework. Uh, the, the successful conclusion of TTIP would have positive impact on the world economy as, as well. Uh, greater demand for raw materials, soup products and services would increase uh, EU and US trade with third countries. Uh, common U.S. EU standards would sim simplify the rules of the world trade and ease the access to the market and lower, lower the productivity cost for the t third countries. Now I come to the, the, uh, the, the, the point I was invited to talk about, uh, uh, the, the, the importance of the TTIP of, for the Czech Republic and the, the Czech priorities. Uh, I must say at the beginning that all the major political parties in the Czech Republic support uh, the, the, the successful conclusion of the TTIP. Although uh, for at this moment of time it's difficult to say what are the major political parties in the Czech Republic. Uh, our uh, uh, close transatlantic ties uh, f uh, would contribute, uh, as I uh, come from the security field, not only to economy but also also to, to, to security for, for all our allies on both sides of the Atlantic. The contribution of the free trade with the U.S. to the Czech economy will be real. Even the least optimistic analysis show that trade liberalization with the U.S. would strengthen the Czech economic growth by 0.2 percent. The most uh, optimistic scenario predicts the growth increase by 2.6 percent. Uh, the uh, most pessimistic uh, figure for the, the new jobs is 6,000. Uh, the, the most optimistic 22,000 of new jobs. Uh, which would mean a decrease in unemployment rate by 0 0.1 uh, to 0.4 uh, percent. The areas that would benefit most uh, uh, in, in the Czech Republic are energy sector, automotive industry, medical technology, IT, nanotechnologies, research and development. Uh, uh, and these are also issues that are, that are uh, priorities for the Czech Republic. Uh, we, we, we support, uh, and I think it's true for, for any possible government that might come from, of, after these elections we had, uh, speedy and uh, thorough negotiations and conclusion of, uh, of the, the agreement. I also can say that uh, if, uh, the Czech political establish, establishment uh, is of the view that the current spying affair that was mentioned by Sasha and others should not influence the negotiations uh, for myself. Uh, for 
I am happy that uh, not only uh, for China and Russia and others are spying on us, but there is some, also someone from our side that is listening and uh, maybe making some, some conclusions uh, for, uh, for what, what, is, what, what are the areas uh, in the negotiations that we pay most attention to, uh, it is uh, first uh, energy and uh, raw materials, uh, 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 namely energy security, transit, nuclear energy, shale gas. Uh, these are all areas where uh, there are also differences between the EU member states, uh, but uh, it's very important that all those are tackled within the TTIP. Uh, for, well, we, we believe that the idea for regulatory uh, cooperation council or something like that is a, is a, is a very good idea with the, the name uh, of as strong as possible reduction of regulatory obstacles. Uh, of course, uh, there, there, there are limits uh, in the possibilities how, how strong this, this can be. Uh, for, then mutual recognition of, of, of standards and uh, regulatory convergence in the areas like automotive sector and medical technologies uh, are very important for Czech industry uh, uh, and uh, coordination of rules in the, uh, in the area of uh, financial regulations. Uh, it is. Uh, it is uh, not clear, as was mentioned, how far we can go uh, in the TTIP in this uh, area with the U.S., but uh, we hope uh, at least something can be achieved. achieved. In the area of investments, uh, what is important for the Czech Republic is the full replacement of the current bilateral trade agreement by the, the, the new TTIP. And uh, for in the area of services, of course, it's uh, better access to the, to the U.S. market. Uh, for, I, I must say, uh, going far further from the Czech Republic, that uh, for, in, in, in my view, uh, TTIP will uh, for, uh, not be beneficial only for U.S. and EU, but also for the third countries. There are... Uh, often discussions about whether um, TTIP will hurt the economies of the third partners or uh, how it will, it will impact them. Uh, I believe those that uh, say that uh, TTIP will harm the trade investment, trade interest of the third countries are wrong. Uh, if, uh, I think that by reducing and eliminating uh, regulatory barriers between EU and the US uh, uh, will <clears throat> also allow for improved market access for producers from other countries. For example, the companies around the world that export to both Europe and the United States currently have to comply with two sets of standards and regulations, uh, often requiring separate production processes the improvement in regulatory compatibility between EU and US uh, under TTIP should have a direct positive impact on those companies. Uh, finally, the large economic size of the EU and US means that partner countries will themselves have an incentive to move toward the, any new transatlantic standard, standards that the TTIP creates. It would improve market access between EU, US, and those countries, and it may also reduce trade barriers between those countries themselves. Uh, the creation of massive trade block will also boost the competitiveness and expand the market share of the countries that play by the rules. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it will weaken the countries known for dumping unsafe products and property rights violations, and this, in my view, is, uh, is quite all right. Uh, to, to conclude, uh, for, uh, I think uh, for TTIP is a win-win scenario for EU and US, uh, but also we win together and we fall together. If we, if we fail, uh, the, the, the countries outside the transatlantic zone uh, 
will in fact win and it will weaken uh, not only uh, the trade between us but it will also also weaken our value values and their influence uh, in the in the world just launching the negotiations boosted market confidence uh, its conclusion will open markets in goods and services investment uh, and many other areas uh, that will help bridge uh, the, the differences and uh, for, of course uh, the the last word more integrated transatlantic economy will help to maintain the strength of transatlantic bond for years to come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much. Well, uh, the next speaker uh, would talk from what I would say is something in between the Czech and the global perspective, that's Jan Milfeit, currently works as a uh, chairman Europe for Microsoft, so uh, somebody who spent most of his time somewhere in between Brussels, Seattle, Prague, also Lithuania this year, because uh, he's also the advisor to the Prime Minister of Lithuania. Lithuanians has, uh, have the presidency uh, in the EU uh, right now. Uh, uh, how to introduce him? It brings me back uh, somewhere to uh, 1998. I was uh, in Washington as the Czech ambassador and uh, Washington and Brussels had launched uh, the new transatlantic uh, economic partnership that was the second attempt after NTA. Uh, it was called TEP, Transatlantic Economic Partnership then. And as a part of that exercise, uh, they have also launched uh, something what they called, or we called, although we were not a member of the EU at that time, uh, what they called uh, the Transatlantic Business Dialogue, TEBD. We uh, were also invited and I was, you know, picking up the phone and calling the various uh, uh, Czech businesses, the big businesses like, you know, Chess. I do not remember who was the, the, the president or the CEO at that time. Uh, uh, but uh, basically, any of my attempts uh, to approach Chess, to approach uh, Unipetrol to approach uh, what it be now as O2 and was Eurotel at that time, uh, with the offer to participate, uh, were not successful because those Czech businesses um, were not used to, uh, uh, to the global uh, operation. And uh, the idea that they would have to pay for something what would not generate immediate benefit uh, was something beyond uh, their horizon. The only guy who was, uh, at, at least as, whether I remember well, uh, was somehow the part of this uh, transatlantic business, business dialogue was uh, Jan Milfeit. Uh, then uh, he was not the chairman of Europe, he was the, the chairman of the Czech Republic operations. Uh, and um, right now, just frankly, if uh, I'm talking in the corridors of Brussels uh, about, uh, about the Czechs uh, having some influence with all the respect to uh, the politicians, with all the respect to the clerks. There are usually two guys who have some uh, access uh, and that's uh, Ivan Hodac, who's a long time president of the European Federation for the Automotive Industry, logically, you know, because we are automotive power. Uh, he was very, very active uh, when this uh, 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 last uh, free trade agreement uh, on the EU, uh, EU playground uh, has been concluded. Uh, before Canada, it was EU-Korean uh, uh, agreement, of course, Korean Republic, which was pretty sensitive, of course, for the automotive industry, you can imagine. And... Uh, that was the guy who was, uh, who could you seen uh, anywhere. And uh, Jan Melfeit uh, certainly has also a, 
very uh, rich experience dealing with the EU because uh, it was Microsoft who paid the largest uh, fine uh, ever uh, <laughs> uh, dealing with the EU regulatory measures. So I am very glad that, uh, uh, that Jan Milfeid has accepted uh, my invitation and come to Prague uh, to speak to you. So please, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, very good evening. Uh, Sasha, thanks very much for the invitation and the kind you know, words which uh, my father would enjoy and my mother would probably even believe. <laughs> uh, I would like to talk about three big uh, mega points about technology and how technology is influencing economy in general, but also how it will influence TTIP. Uh, Second point on, I would like to mention, you know, global competition and competitiveness and compare EU and US because I was part of the advisory group working for World Economic Forum two years ago and we did some interesting study. And last point, I have a lot of, you know, numbers and graphs from Dan Hamilton uh, study on how important is this, you know, relationship to give even, you know, uh, you more shooting powder if uh, you can, you know, promote the agreement. Uh, I'm the software engineer, uh, as uh, some of you may know, uh, from profession. And it's interesting because uh, uh, today what I carry here, this mobile phone, it's just ordinary smartphone. But the funny thing is that it has 10 times more computing power than what was computing power of, you know, all NASA when I was born in 1962. It's called Moore Law, and it says, and I will be a little bit technical now, it says that every second year you are doubling the density of transistors on the chip. Why I'm saying that? Because this, you know, Moore Law is changing everything. There's a very little exponential relationship in society or in nature, and this is the one. And it's changing, you know, everything. Uh, Mrs. Lamalova talk, and I was asking about this reindustrialization. I think because of the Moore law and all technological changes, we will not change what will be done in economy, but we will very significantly change how things will be done in economy. And I will give you one example. I was recently in OECD talking to a couple of people there, and I asked them, if the new car is produced in France, Germany, or Czech, how the car is captured in the statistics? And they said, it's a car, it's a piece of, you know, iron, so it's a car. Okay, I said, no. The, the new, if you take just new Mercedes, I mean, you can, you know, buy it here, right? It's a 16 full-fledged computers, and the cost of that car, 60% of the cost, is basically software. So the product is software product. It's no more hardware product. This is what Germany or the U.S. is now doing with what is called reindustrialization. It's not only like moving back to the traditional industries, but it's taking traditional strengths of those industries, like you know, automotive in Germany, engineering, whatever, putting their high tech and moving to the next you know, level, basically. That's what I call reindustrialization. That's the reason why the you know, United States is successful in export and trade, and why some of the countries are more successful in Europe than the others. I think this, you know, Moore law is super important from the technological standpoint, but also from the uh, economical point of view. And as, was, as it was discussed, you know, before, uh, how much, you know, uh, TTIP is concerned also about the regulation, I give you another example where this, this negotiation can help not only industry like us, but all, you know, society here in Europe and in the United States. Healthcare, it's 16, 17 percent in the U.S., something like that. Europe is 8 to 12 percent of the GDP, depends country to country. If you take just chronic diseases it's in Europe, it's 6.8 percent of the overall European GDP. Because we are not able to connect kind of the well-being and lifestyle of the people with the healthcare. And I tell you why, Sasha mentioned that I'm involved in the transatlantic business dialogue, because we talk for like seven, eight years about the patient health record, what, what should be the 
you know, uh, uh, basically the format of the record. We can't, by the way, agree even in Europe, right? So it's like French are saying, if it's the French record, that's fine. That's the re European record, right? And we need to agree because it will not, not only save money, but it will, you know, enable people to have a better lives here and also overseas and save, you know, money and make healthcare better. And obviously there is opportunity, I am open with you, there's also opportunity for industry. So that's, the, that, that's the, the, the one reason, which is the trade reason, it's quite obvious. But the other one I tried to figure out when you, you spoke about the regulation, this is one example where it would be super helpful to have agreement as soon as possible on that, okay? So uh, now on the uh, uh, competitiveness, there are like, uh, it's just for a little bit of your, you know, uh, uh, education, there are like two models of uh, the competitiveness, how the national competitiveness is measured, one is IMD, uh, this one is the World Economic Forum, and basically it measures uh, 12, there are like 12 different, you know, pillars, I, I will not uh, drill down on, on those, but it compares uh, different, you know, subjects of the economy. It's not only GDP and, you know, economy, like employment and so on, but it's also higher education, healthcare, the size of the market, infrastructure, and so on. What is important, and I, I don't know if you can, you know, read it, but what is Im important, if, if you take uh, top ten, there are obviously like Singapore number two, uh, I think uh, it's Hong Kong number six, and then Japan number eight, but the rest of that, it's like U.S. is number five. There are, you know, European countries. So it's a, it's a mix of, you know, U.S. and the, the European countries. And I, what, is, what is quite interesting to show that this is, in fact, second time when Germany is uh, a little bit above, it's just, you know, one uh, point above the United States. But to say so, I'm, I, I try to say that, you know, if you have open relationships, and I think open trade is about the open relationships, it means also the higher competitiveness. There is a, you know, clear correlation uh, between those two. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit on this, you know, interesting comparison. We took uh, two years ago, basically, the EU 2020, for those of you who are perhaps not familiar, it's like the agenda how, you know, uh, EU should compete in the future. There are, you know, seven uh, different pillars of that, you know, competition. So we, we've taken those seven pillars and we compare basically, you know, EU with the, that's the uh, blue one, uh, with the United States, that's uh, red, uh, Japan, it's yellow, and then, you know, dotted, it's Canada. And this is basically, we, we've taken the EU competitiveness agenda, because that's what, we, that's what all countries agreed. When, when Sasha was a deputy prime minister, that was even agreed by the you know, Czech government. I think during the Czech presidency, it, this agenda was discussed, in fact. Uh, you know, right? And as you can see, with the exception of, you know, social pillar, Europe is really lacking, you know, uh, behind. There, there are, there's like, a, uh, in, if you, if I, I need to be fair, uh, sorry, with the exception of social and environmental, where the U.S. is lacking behind, mm. Europe is not doing that great. And it's a European, you know, agenda. It's our own, you know, plan, right? So just to say that we can, you know, learn from each other, obviously, also, in this, you know, trade and investment agreement, but also in terms of the, uh, competitiveness. But interesting point, I, I try to say uh, that, uh, mm, and it, this is obviously a little bit, you know, older because it was published like one and a half uh, year ago, uh, there is a still, uh, you know, in, in terms of the competitiveness, there's a still a way to go. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers, how this, you know, relationship is important. And I'm the guy who is co-chairing Emerging market cabinet in Microsoft, so I'm always saying, you know, China, Russia, all of those countries are important. But if you take reality, reality indeed looks differently, right? And just if you compare, this is the GDP uh, comparison uh, in terms of the uh, PPP, uh, purchasing parity power, there's a population and other, you know, elements, but the first line, uh, if you take uh, U.S. and Europe together, it's almost uh, 43%. The third column, as you see, it's uh, uh, Asia, and uh, the, the, the other one is uh, commodity 
producers. Now, uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, it shows the GDP growth uh, on a different uh, uh, time frames. Obviously, there is a, a clear, you know, a crisis element. But what I, what I try to say that, you know, Europe's got a drop even after the crisis. We know why. There was a Greece, you know, uh, thing and, and so on. But I think that if we will have even more open relationship, chances are that we will catch up with the U.S. growth in Europe. I mean, I don't have, I'm not economist, but I think chances are that uh, it, will, uh, it will happen. So that, that's the GDP growth, very important uh, element. The next one, I need to turn the page. Uh, uh, the next one, it's, uh, it's basically uh, FDI, and it's clear, right? And this, those are like the years and percentages out of the worldwide spend of the U.S. corporation, investment of the U.S. You know, corporations. Uh, and even in 2000, uh, kind of uh, uh, 12 uh, till Q3, uh, it was 56% uh, of, the, of the total. I was like looking on a couple of you know, cases what our company did. It. We did you know, investment with Skype, you know, Kia, Navision. You can say, well, it's, it doesn't count because it's a... Uh, uh, you know, a merge basically. It's true. On the other hand, we also spend around 600 million US dollars every year on a different, you know, R&D and investments uh, here. Uh, anyway, now, uh, where another interesting uh, from uh, uh, Dan Hamilton report, another interesting figures, and this is comparing of the three trade agreement. The first one is uh, the uh, one between EU and the United States. The second one is trans. Uh, Pacific, and the third one is, you know, NAFTA. And it's clear that, you know, uh, if, if I take as a percentage of the total uh, world uh, GDP, EU, US, uh, 20%, because I, I don't know if you can read it, right? Uh, uh, Trans-Pacific, it's 7.3%, uh, and NAFTA almost 4%, 3.9%. So, again, if you compare, you know, those, and I think those, we, we are comparing, you know, apples to apples, and we are fair to the others, again, you see this is, you know, the most important relationship for us, but also for the uh, United States. Uh, now, they call it this slide, you know, power brokers. Uh, kind of the, the first, you know, uh, is uh, EU America. Uh, the Asia is the second column. And Chin India and Chin America uh, are like the third and the fourth column. Uh, again, it's a much, even like EU, uh, America, the GDP in PPP is almost, oh, it's 4.1% uh, higher than the total, you know, Asian one, right? So uh, we are, I'm, I'm the guy. Uh, who is like, yeah, we need to invest as a company and even as EU in a relationship with Asia. On the other hand, you see that the reality is still there. And you may say, well, the dynamic is there and so on. It's true. You need to have balance on, on whatever you are doing. But still, this is a, a, a most important uh, relationship. Uh, now, transatlantic economy as a percentage of the total economy, and there are different, uh, like the world GDP, uh, the, the m &As. You see the m &As over here, almost like 64% uh, of whatever is happening in terms of the mergers and acquisitions is, uh, you know, between us and uh, United States. And now a uh, little bit on innovation because it has to do a lot with the uh, competitiveness. This is like the, uh, uh, the, the, the companies and investment in innovation. So with the exception of, you know, Toyota, like uh, top, uh, I would say, almost 15 companies, uh, or, or 14 companies because Honda is 15, are, uh, you know, European or uh, American companies. So again, it shows, you know, uh, yeah, importance of that. So, Net net to to summarize, I think uh, what I what I try to say that you know technology will have a lot of influence and is having a significant influence on the overall relationship between EU and United States, and it's happening in economy 
through this, you know, more law and reindustrialization, which you will see, I think you will see it more and more. Because there are some traditional industries, and you, you can confirm it, coming back to the United States, you know, right? And they, they really try to move with the high tech, you know, and do like additional value and compete through the traditional strength. So that's a, that's a one point I, I try to make. The other point is that, you know, if you take the global competitiveness, this agreement can help, you know, Americans and can help U.S., but can help significantly the European countries and the overall, you know, EU. And last but not least, the, the one thing is, you know, what every, because it's a, it's a sexy to write about, like, trade with China and other countries, and, and, and we as a company and EU needs to do it, but, you know, reality is different. I'm always the guy who, I'm, and on Friday I will speak at a, at a conference about, you know, relationship with Russia and China. Obviously, I will say 60 to 70 percent of the, you know, uh, economical growth will come next 10 years from emerging markets, but, you know, still the huge amount is happening on traditional markets, and that's why we need to have this, you know, strong bond and strong relationship. And you are all citizens, you know, here or in Europe. So I think we need to push politicians to put this on, on the very top, you know, as a very top priority on the agenda. And it, it's true both in the United States and here in Europe. Thank you very much. Well, I like it, this Chimerica versus Ameropa or Oimerica. <laughs> uh, okay, the time's come for your questions. Comments, remarks? Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Michael, and I would like to ask you a question. Uh, this treaty uh, is also tricky a bit. I mean, uh, to fight all the protectionists, uh, the states, I know it's very hard, but is it a part of a bigger plan? Because I am thinking about bigger treaty, for example, with Australia, New Zealand. These are also well-developed markets, and the treaty with them might be also important and interesting. Is there any idea about this? Thank you. Did you understand whether, you know, what to do with New Zealand, Australia, to renew the coalition of the World War I and World War II? No, I, look, all the things is, it's always, to me, it's always about, you know, resources. You have some limited resources, so you need to apply them. I think all of those relationships you mentioned are very important. And it doesn't mean, and I'm not here like the European Commission or whatever, but EU, for example, is, you know, doing very good progress in negotiation with Canada, as I know, because I had a, yesterday a lunch with the Canadian ambassador here, here in Prague, you know. So I think it doesn't mean that, you know, EU or on the other side, US is not, you know, working on those uh, relationships. I, I only try to say this is the most uh, important relationship in the world still, and it's clear, like in the economical sense, but also in the political sense. Thank, thank, thank you very much. And, uh, well, I don't want to speak for United States, but certainly United States is in parallel with the TTIP negotiating a Pacific Treaty, basically, with the countries you mentioned, and also Japan and few others. Uh, EU is negotiating a treaty with Japan kind of slowly. Canada has been almost completed. Uh, so, for, yes, uh, for free trade treaties, I think, are recognized as an important tool. Uh, for, and I think Australia and New Zealand will come in time also as partners, as a trade. Well, there are import, they are important trade partners for, for the EU, but uh, there will come time for, uh, for, to, to have a treaty with them as well. Only they are a bit too far and a bit... Uh, to small partners at this moment to start with uh, exactly with them. I, I think there was a very instructional map in Lutz's presentation uh, on who is doing you know business with whom, like number one you know uh, uh, traders, uh, 
And if I'm not mistaken, Australia was number one with China, and I guess it's because of the natural resources, but that's fine. It doesn't mean that we will not, you know, work together. But it's just to say, you know, there are a lot of countries around the world. But the U.S. has a free trade agreement with Australia since 2004, and 57 Democrats were voting in favor, 57 percent of Democrats, and 87 percent of Republicans voted in favor. <laughs> So Europe should find some inspiration how to bring the Gallipoli uh, experience into the economic market. Who else? Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Petr Horinsky and as I have a background in industry, I would be interested in your opinion on how far Maybe it's better without the mic. It doesn't work. <laughs> Does it work? Okay, it works now. So I would be interested in your opinion, how far could uh, this uh, trade agreement uh, support and expand the industrial base of European states and also from gentlemen from the United States, the base of United States. If you could then support your idea with some figures. Thank you very much. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I fully understand what you mean by industrial base. No, I, I, uh, I must say that there were, you know, I, I do like competitiveness of the countries for 15 years now, right, uh, since I was in, in Germany. And, you know, there were a lot of countries doing that, you know, mistake. They tried to, like, absolutely shift, you know, whatever they were, you know, doing in the past. And it's an absolutely wrong approach. You need to take your traditional strengths, apply new technologies and new business processes, and compete through that. And I think Germany is a good example. There are good examples from Scandinavia, you know, and the U.S. is also a good example. Uh, the U.K., I mean, they struggle still because they push industry out. There's a lot of financial industry, uh, which is now uh, kind of, you know, limited. So they, they try to do reindustrialization in the U.K., and I hope that they will be, you know, successful. So I think with the, with the new technologies, your industry, it's good to have like 60% of the services, that's perfect. But I think it will blur together. Industry and services will blur together. Because if you take like cloud computing, is it, you know, service? What is, is it industry? What is it? What I'm afraid more, especially from the European standpoint, is a digital single market, which does not exist today, right? So, because today, I mean, you, you don't have like, you have a free movement of, you know, almost free movement of the people, your products, services is the question mark still, and the money that's probably almost okay, but digital single market does not exist. We did, I was in some group, we did some research, and if there will be digital single market enabled across Europe, it will be additional four points in the, in the GDP growth between now and 2020. Uh, you know, Mario Monte put it in the, to the report for uh, Barroso like two, three years ago, right? So that's where I'm afraid of, because there are things like with the, with the digital single market. I'll give you one example. Everybody talks about cloud computing and those services, and I was like healthcare or whatever. But today in Europe, it's not even clear if the German government would host data in Ireland, in the data center, in Google or Microsoft or whatever, it's not clear which law applies. Is it the Irish law or the law of the countries in between, or is it the German law? So we need to fix the basic, basically. That's the, that's the point. No, oh, I, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, ideally, the good treaty would strengthen both industry and services on both sides of Atlantic. So, uh, and the, all, all other has been said. Okay, the, the other question, yeah, please, Lutz. 
I have actually a question back to the panel. Uh, do you think in uh, the Czech Republic there's a good understanding of the, what the, the transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership, what it could hold in terms of benefits and what would need to be done to increase this understanding? So in terms of public debate, what, what would be necessary, you know, from in your view? Well, th thank you. Uh, for, I, I think, as you might have guessed, uh, there is uh, not good understanding of uh, the, the treaty and its potential uh, yet. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite logical, I would even say, because uh, it's, a, it's, a new, uh, it's not a new concept, but the negotiations uh, just started. There was not much publicity. Uh, for, and there, there, there are not specific, uh, for very sensitive national issues. So there is basically no particular reason for the media also to uh, to pick on uh, on each round of negotiations and so on. But uh, to uh, for, it, it's very important to familiarize the, the the country, the elites, the industries with uh, the, the the treaty, its concept and its potential. We first need to do more, more conferences like like Severo today. We also probably need to do targeted uh, events uh, for for uh, different selected groups uh, and uh, for, well anything else uh, that uh, for you suggest would be welcome. Uh, maybe I would add something, you know, because uh, we should differentiate between those two baskets, which I was trying to uh, uh, to describe on this smoker's dilemma uh, before. So, on one hand, there is this free trade and the real liberalization agenda, and here, uh, of course, that there are some sensitive items, uh, you know. For example, the automotive industry, on one hand, you can imagine a huge uh, possibilities in opening the market. On the other hand, like this is the example of the EU-Korea uh, deal, uh, it raised the competition and, and certainly, you know, if uh, you have a strong uh, industrial sector, uh, uh, like here, where, you know, the Czechs and the Slovaks are probably the more most intensive uh, automotive producers in the world, measured by, you know, car per capita. Uh, but still, uh, you know, the public debate is not uh, what uh, is the most important here. Usually the businesses are strong enough or at least active enough uh, to take care. And uh, I do not remember if, frankly, in the last 20, 25 years when we do have a freedom, any strong measure, public measures, public activism against uh, uh, the free trade as a such. Even the trade unions, they did not uh, join. You know, yes, there were some riots uh, during the World Bank and IMF uh, meeting in 2000, but it was rather uh, inflow of certain fashion outside, from outside. But then there is the second basket, and that's this, uh, all those regulatory uh, measures. Uh, on one hand, uh, you know, to eliminate the tariffs on the toilet, to eliminate the quotas on the toilet uh, export imports. On the other hand, uh, the European Union brings more and more regulations into, uh, uh, you know, in the name of the public safety, uh, in the name of the environmental protection. And here it's more delicate because, uh, you know, pretty often those uh, measures are adopted without any public awareness. And in fact, uh, my experience is that they are pretty often adopted without uh, even the awareness of those uh, people who have the power uh, to say no, uh, because it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, to find those devils in, in, into the millions of the papers. So uh, simply, it's, it's quite often that the, not just the public, but even some uh, policy makers uh, got to know about those specific regulation when it's already uh, in force. When uh, there is an information that something, you know, what uh, 
was uh, available on the market uh, should not be available next year because simply there is a ban. And here it's difficult. Uh, uh, it's difficult uh, uh, what to do to raise the public awareness, uh, including the, uh, the awareness of those uh, responsible people who are obliged, you know, to say yes or no. Uh, uh, in advance, uh, in a moment when you can influence that, because here the problem is, uh, if uh, the public is taken by surprise, uh, you know, pretty often, then uh, it can uh, it can raise the negative public uh, stand towards uh, 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 the project as such. So. The danger lies, I think, in this second uh, arena more than in, in the free trade itself. And the next question. We need some, you know, prolonged debate because Jan Zahradil is just on the way here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. This is a, this is a question, for, for, question for Jan. Um, you mentioned Moore's Law. Uh, how long do you think that will continue? Will it continue indefinitely, or have we, have we reached the limit yet? So, okay, okay. Uh, so the, the question is on the Moore Law, how long that can survive? And to be honest, when I was in this school, like 25 years ago, I thought it, it may go for another 10 years. And I was traveling with, you know, Bill Gates, and he was, he was always a huge fan of the Moore Law. He was saying it, it will go for a, a lot of years, but it looks like now, I mean, every, everything, if, if, you, if you talk to res, researchers, they are basically saying that there is no, you know, capacity, it's just, there's no issue they can, you know, see uh, with, the, with the Moore law. So maybe, you know, I'm, I'm wrong, but uh, I think, uh, you know, Moore law will bring in, in ne next five years, if we will have this meeting in five years from now, this glass will have probably sensors, and I will be able to figure out what is the temperature of the water, who is the producer, and etc. and etc. And it will be connected to the internet, right? That's the that's the power of the of the Moore law, right? If I mean, if somebody would tell you what would be the power of the phones, you know, today the phones are computers, right? That, that's why some you know companies were not successful because they didn't realize that phones are getting computers, in fact. So. Don't be afraid. <laughs> it will affect your life, so you now have the chance to <laughs> influence this. Yeah, thank you. So, so maybe I will. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I will ask a question just to, uh, you know, so that uh, we don't need to. Sorry, we don't need to wait in silence before uh, Mr. Zahradil arrives. Uh, so the question is basically, I would like to refer to what is called as uh, competitive um, liberalization. Um, that um, basically refers to the US and the EU, um, especially in particular in the Asia Pacific region, uh, whereby you know, both these powers, they are trying to uh, establish various uh, FTA agreements uh, so look at the you know US uh, in Southeast Asia uh, with Singapore and um, the latest FDA between the EU and in Singapore look at Korea uh, look at Japan now and so on so now my, my question is um, do you think uh, in light of the fact that uh, you know now the the EU US are negotiating the TTIP um, then um, in, in the case of the Asia Pacific you have the EU the US has been vigorously negotiating the, the Trans-Pacific trans uh, Partnership. And some scholars actually they say that the U.S. is actually uh, well positioned to, you know, even more than the EU, because the, EU, the U.S. is basically negotiating a comprehensive agreement in the Asia-Pacific, and at the same time with the EU, that the U.S. is more, you know, will be the, the, the real game changer or its, its you know, FTA policies. Uh, do you think is the, is the U.S. Um, will it be even more, let's say, dominant player in the FTA negotiations, you know, the liberalization process and so on. 
Because it's basically negotiating on, on, on both fronts, the important fronts with the, with the, with the, you know, with the, because the EU, US, sorry, the EU has been really picking, you know, they have uh, concluded only with um, the FTA, only with, uh, with the Korea and with Singapore. And it's been, say, regarding ASEAN countries, they haven't really gone very far. No, I, I, I would say you, you mentioned ASEAN, it's another 520 million people. I think it's a, it's a very, you know, important uh, element of that. And I think we need to do, you know, partnership with the U.S. and have a uh, relationship. I agree with you. If we talk about, you know, because one thing is like liberalization and, you know, FDA enablement and so on. The other thing, if you want to be like attractive for, because you are from Czech Invest, right? Okay, you, you mentioned it. Uh, you, if you want to be attractive for, you know, investment, obviously you need to have the right policies, no doubts about that, or you need to have a very good, you know, uh, if you want to have, be attractive for the investors, you need to have a very good workforce. And I think major issue I have today in Czech Republic is that currently, I, and I was bringing, because I'm in the management board of the Czech Invest, by the way, so I was bringing some investors bringing like 300, 400, you know, positions in the software development, they were not able to hire those people, you know, right here. So it's already issue with like technical, with what we call STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math. But what I'm even more afraid are the results of the Czech, you know, pupils in international comparisons uh, like OECD PESA, which measures mathematics, uh, reading and science, where we used to be in 97, number seven, now we are number 27, and one third of the pupils in Czech Republic, they don't know what they are reading, they don't understand the text, basically. That's, that's where I'm afraid, if you, if you talk about like investors and investment, I know it has nothing to do with this you know, topic and the conference, but that's probably the major thing where the, and it's rather to talk to the Ministry of Education, obviously, but that's where I'm really afraid. And in the area of uh, trade, trade agreements, I think it's, uh, for a bit, it's a bit exaggerated, but it's about who will be setting the standards in the world. If we, uh, the EU and the US, uh, complete a good agreement uh, for soon, it will be us who will be setting the standards. Uh, if the Asian Pacific group, uh, which I, I think is not so easy for the US to negotiate with this group because uh, uh, different from the EU, it's not uh, one block that is pretty close, although we are not so close all the time, but it's different countries and you negotiate with all of them, but basically individually, all of them together. So it's uh, more of a mess, I would say, than uh, the, the, the TTIP negotiations, uh, and if, if, they, if they agree uh, f, uh, f sooner than we do, basically uh, these standards would be relevant also for our negotiations, but I don't think this, uh, this is something that uh, is very likely to happen. But of course, Asian countries are seeing it the same way. They, and they are watching very carefully what we do and how we negotiate because they know for they will be affected. Uh, they, the, the, the way they, they work will be affected. Uh, maybe I, I can add some question, uh, Jan. Uh, it's related. Well, the Snowden affair has uh, brought on the light uh, a lot about you know the, the data processing data flows uh, information exchange and uh, what is uh, uh, Microsoft is an IT company uh, what does it mean this debate for the business in the IT uh, area are there some uh, concerns uh, uh, regarding uh, more tough regulatory measures or um, on the other hand uh, you see some opportunities in this because it, it, it is somehow interlinked. I think uh, you know uh, uh, the, our friends in the audience they can you know read the press here and in international press so I, I don't want to repeat all of those you know stories 
I was just recently in Berlin two weeks ago, last week in, in Paris. It's not very helpful for the business, and not only it's, you may think, hey, it's only bad for American companies, but all, you know, all companies, whoever is doing business in the U.S., it's exposed the same way as American companies are exposed, point, you know, right? So we, what we try to do, first of all, I think it needs to be solved on the, you know, uh, level in between EU and uh, uh, U.S. or the EU countries and, and the U.S. because I, I do think this is a mainly political issue. For the business, we are not afraid there will be more regulation, but we are rather asking for, you know, more clarity, like in what cases are we really obliged? And you can read the Microsoft, you know, web page, what exactly Microsoft is doing, what we are obliged to do, and so on. But it's still a lot of unclarity what we are, you know, obliged to do with some of the data. And it's true for the U.S., but it's also true for uh, EU. Well, I, I, I never heard about spies that are deterred by regulation, so... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that new regulation would, would solve uh, the, 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 the crisis. Uh, I rather think that, 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 that some issues that normally are better unexposed were unfortunately exposed and things that uh, a politician uh, assume and silently ex if, uh, expect uh, were uh, brought to the open, which is unfortunate for for basically everyone. So thank you very much to our excellent panelists uh, from the Czech uh, global uh, perspective. And uh, my great pleasure is to introduce the last final speaker of uh, our event here. Uh, that is Jan Zahradil. I want to uh, thank uh, all of you, you know, who were willing to uh, engage in a discussion with the question that uh, he would uh, make it from, uh, from the airport because he is the member of the European Parliament. Uh, uh, the long-time member for ODS, and I think he does not need any special introduction in this country. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jan Zahradil because uh, he is the president of the Alliance of uh, uh, the European uh, Reformers and uh, Conservatives and Reformers, uh, and uh, with uh, his uh, help, we were able to make this conference. Uh, because it was supported by, by the airline, so thank you very much. And, uh, you know, in some of those presentations, we have heard a lot about uh, the pitfalls of uh, the U.S. Congress, you know, fast track, whether, uh, uh, why, why the president did not, uh, did not uh, grant uh, uh, the trade promotion authority yet, uh, what we could expect uh, when there is... Uh, uh, final deal made, whether there are some amendments, and so on and so on. But the European Parliament uh, has not been mentioned at all, although uh, it's an important institution, because without the European Parliament consent, uh, there would not be any, 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 trade, uh, any trade agreement in future. And this, uh, this growing activism of, 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 of uh, uh, the European Parliament, we can also uh, expect a lot of say. And in fact, uh, uh, discussing this influence of, of the Snowden uh, espionage affair, uh, European Parliament is a traditional uh, playground, you know, where uh, those uh, things are uh, being, uh, being discussed. So, uh, please, Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how I should call you today, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, okay, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a great pleasure to be here and uh, also to represent an organization which um, somehow supported this event. Uh, I'm very glad to do that. 
Besides other things, the ACR is uh, very strongly devoted to promoting transatlantic link uh, in, in every possible aspect. And uh, uh, I'm not going to say anything, anything special here. Uh, I can probably only summarize what has been said before. Uh, on one hand, the, the US-EU partnership, uh, political, economic, whatever, uh, seems to be very natural. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on a second look, uh, sometimes it turns to, into a, a rather complicated thing. Uh, because of a uh, few aspects, uh, we in Europe might have had a feeling that uh, uh, Mr. Obama and his administration didn't pay that much attention to uh, US-EU uh, relations in recent years like the previous administrations and on the other hand also uh, the atmosphere and the nature in, in European institutions and most particularly in the European Parliament uh, have changed and uh, I'm, I'm sad to say that but uh, it's, it's true, it's fact that uh, uh, more united Europe and uh, more powerful uh, European institutions sometimes uh, means uh, less pro-American Europe and less pro-American European institutions as well. Uh, so uh, uh, these ambitions of the European Parliament uh, mentioned here by Mr. Vondra uh, that are here, uh, like it or not, and that uh, have been even uh, codified in uh, the last treaty, in the Lisbon Treaty, uh, in my best hope will not exceed certain levels and uh, will be at the end driven by a very pragmatic and realistic interest of EU and, and European countries as, as well. Uh, I can only say what probably has been said here before that the EU and US are undoubtedly global economic and political players. The EU economy is currently worth some 12.6 trillion and the US economy about uh, uh, 11.5 uh, trillion, both, both in euros, not in US euros. So uh, each of them uh, and even more both together might outweigh other e key economic players such as China or Japan. And therefore a trade and investment deal between the EU and US uh, is therefore uh, likely to be a very unprecedented deal by its scope, by potential benefits, and by all uh, ramifications. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, maybe it's a little exaggeration, but from my viewpoint, the importance of the TTIP could be comparable uh, in some extent, in some point of view, to that of the post-World War II Marshall Plan. And concluding such a grand scale deal is an opportunity to capitalize on the yet untapped potential in bilateral exchanges and foreign direct investment flows. Uh, already now, our bilateral trade in goods and services accounts for almost uh, 2 billion euros on a daily basis. And therefore, uh, any prospect, even prospect of a half a percent increase in GDP in the EU, uh, which is equivalent of uh, 86 billion uh, euros in annual income to the European economy. It's a very attractive one, uh, especially as we in Europe are still recovering from the crisis and we need to create new job opportunities for our citizens. Uh, probably uh, you have no doubt that uh, uh, I myself, as a member of the European Parliament, will be, as I've always been, a strong proponent uh, of uh, mutually beneficial transatlantic ties. And uh, I have to say, uh, I am proud and I've always been proud to be uh, a very responsible friend of the United States. And I welcome this, this possibility for the EU and US to enter uh, that type, that framework of a strategic trade and investment partnership. I can uh, here point out a uh, few, maybe five following priorities into which, in my feeling, we should focus. Uh, first and foremost, we should focus on eliminating 
unjustified non-tariff barriers to trade. Uh, secondly, uh, we on both sides should try to get rid of uh, red tape, uh, whatever uh, and whenever it prevents smooth and spe speedy bilateral exchanges. Thirdly, we should focus on establishing equivalences or as the Americans say, substitute compliance, where similar outcome is achieved with different legislations on the EU and US side. Uh, fourthly, and uh, uh, I just caught the, the uh, last debate, and this was probably uh, just about that issue, we have to restore both mutual trust and respect in our transatlantic partnership uh, in all possible aspects. And fifthly, we should avoid as much as possible uh, the adoption of rules with extraterritorial effect that would undermine the necessary legal certainty for investors and lead to an increase in arbitration. Um, just to conclude, uh, let me express the hope that uh, uh, if we follow these five and maybe uh, even many more uh, guidelines, uh, that, let me express the hope that uh, if we do that, the TTIP negotiations will result in a foreseeable future in a structured, transparent, and efficient cooperation between the EU and US. Uh, that is uh, uh, in the preparatory phase of NEURUS for bilateral trade in goods and services and investments, like upstream, but also downstream, which is in the resolution of mutual disputes. I can therefore only wish the best of luck to the negotiators on both sides. Uh, cross my fingers for a mutually beneficial deal that will foster trade, investment, and employment in the transatlantic area. And uh, me, myself, and also the organization I represent will be ready and willing uh, to support any such similar event uh, that would uh, open uh, our possibilities for mutual information and uh, getting better uh, knowledge about uh, what's going on on both sides of Atlantic when it comes to trade and investment. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, and I hope that uh, uh, even <laughs> if I was here for the very last few minutes of the last panel, uh, I still hope that uh, everything what we have said today was very beneficial and that you got a lot of information uh, you needed and uh, that it was uh, worthwhile for you. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.